Mr. Chairman of the Sasakawa Foundation and my friends of the Foundation, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me first express my gratitude to the, the Foundation for this invitation, giving, giving me the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Let me also express my pleasure to be in Japan today and for one week. I'll have a lot of meetings during this week and it's a great uh, pleasure for me. Just a few days after the G20 and the, the, the official visit of uh, the French president to Japan. So I'm just putting myself in, 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 the, in the trail of these very good relations between our two countries. Uh, the, the subject I've been asked to deal with today is vast. I'll try to, 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 to express my, uh, my views uh, in a synthetic way as far as it's possible. Maybe before uh, maybe before uh, any anything, uh, I would like to uh, to talk about a paradox. France is known as one of the most secular countries in the world, maybe the most secular, with the principle of laïcité. This is the French word. I shall use it. I shall not translate it because I think that laïcité is different from secularism in in, in English. If I had to translate, I would say secularism, but it's not exactly the same thing. And there is a question, how is it possible that the most secular country in the world has a high-ranking diplomat to deal with religion? If the state and religions are separated, why, why uh, am, I, am I here today in front of you to talk about religion and diplomacy? I think that this question is a paradox just in, uh, apparently. In fact, the real meaning of laïcité is just that religion and the state are separated in order to ensure freedom of freedom to believe or not to believe, and if you believe, to practice your religion, and equality between believers and non-believers, and believers from any religion. And so it does not mean in any way that a religion and the state should ignore themselves, nor that they, would, they should confront. They are separated, and the separation makes, finally, the dialogue easier because, as a civil servant, I know exactly where I'm standing and where, in which capacity I'm speaking. So, laïcité in no way opposes dialogue or even cooperation between the state and religious actors. This being said, what I uh, propose to say tonight is first to think about uh, the, the place or the role of religion in international affairs. And why, why should we, as diplomats, should we deal with it? The second point will be how should we do? What kinds of principles and methods can we implement to make this connection between religion and diplomacy? And finally, because the foundation asked me to talk about the French example, I will tell you how in France we try to, to, to deal with this, uh, this matter. So religion and international affairs, should we deal with this issue, issue and why? I'll begin by quoting a great, a great uh, French writer of the last century, André Malraux. André Malraux said, the 21st century will be religious or won't be at all. And it's true that when we look at the international uh, theater as it is now, we have a good number of reasons to say Malraux was a prophet. He was right, he was right. The 21st century is a religious one. 
I'll give you some uh, dates uh, to, to, to think about that. I like to mention four, four events which happened in a very, very few period of time, in two years, which brought religion on the forefront of international affairs. So, remember, October 1978, election of the Pope John Paul II, an historical event. The first non-Italian Pope in six centuries, a Pope coming from the Soviet uh, system, from a communist country. Remember his first words, don't be afraid. And these words went through all the, the, the planet. Remember the trouble in the Kremlin and in the Polish government at that time. And remember the role, the decisive role, that Pope John Paul played in supporting the Solidarność trade union in, 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 uh, in Poland, in speaking for uh, freedom, for human rights, the role he played for the collapse of the Soviet Union, which happened 12 years la later. October 78, February 79, the Islamic Revolution in Iran. For the first time, a big country, very important in the world, proclaimed this itself a religious country, Islamic Republic of Iran, for the first time. We have to remember, now it's very common to say that we oppose the Shi'is and, and the Sunnis. But the impact of the Islamic revolution of Iran was broader than the only Shiite world. It played a role in Lebanon with the creation of the Hezbollah. But it played a role in all the Muslim world. It even inspired the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. The, the, the Brotherhood did exist before. But there was an example given by Iran, so it's possible to, to create a religious state. It's possible to, to, to base a, a policy on the, on the motto, the slogan, Islam is the solution. As if religion could be the solution to pollution, to unemployment, to uh, health uh, issues. But this idea changed the Islamic world and changed our look from the Western side, I'm speaking from my European position, and the Islamic side. Ten months later, January 1980, the Soviet military intervention in Afghanistan. It was the, the military confrontation between a religiously inspired armed movement and the, one of the two uh, super, uh, military superpowers, the Soviet Union. Remember, that's the time and the context where Al-Qaeda was created, where the, the, the international jihadist ideology was founded. I'm not saying that it did not exist before, but the, the, I mean, the, the, the constitution of this ideology in the modern time took its roots in the Afghan conflict. And at the end of November, 1980, November, maybe it can be a surprise, but there, there is a fourth event I want to mention, which is the election of Ronald Reagan as the, the American, uh, the, the president of the US. Why do I mention this event? Because for the first time in a presidential election in, in the US, it was very clear that the religiously inspired uh, rightist movement in, in the US can be very influential. And it never ceased from that time. And we, when you look at now the domestic, <clears throat> 
uh, American uh, theater, political theater, <clears throat> you see how strong the, what I call the evangelical or neo-evangelical rightist influence can be on American policies. So I, I, I quote these four events because, because in two years, in, in Iran, in Europe, in, the, in America, you, you see the religious factor who is playing a decisive uh, role. And now, in the last 40 years, what happened? What is, what is the situation today? I'm not exhaustive and I just quote examples. Islamic fundamentalism is there. Islam, Islamist jihadism is there and act very active. We had Al-Qaeda and now, in addition, we have Daesh and other, other movements up to the Filipinos and, and in Europe. It's not uh, something theoretical. France uh, was submitted to very tragic terrorist attacks. So it's not, I mean, it's not just an idea, it's a real political reality. Look at India, in Asia. We have a, 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 not, a, not a, I would say, not a nationalistic government. We have a national religious government in India. The, the, the identification between national identity and a religious or supposed religious identity is the core of, uh, of the, 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 uh, the actual uh, uh, ideology uh, which has the power in, in India. Uh, look at the rise of neo-evangelical neo uh, uh, churches or movements in Latin America. A country like Guatemala, I visited last year. Guatemala, 50 years ago, was 100% Catholic. Now it's 50% Catholic. And 50% evangelical. It completely destroys the balance of the population including the constitutional framework which proclaimed that Catholicism was a state religion. It's not a problem if the, the population is 100% of this religion. It's not the case in, anymore. By the way, it brings also foreign money uh, uh, channels. It uh, um, creates a more sectarian approach inside, inside the society because many of these movements are not in favor of interfaith or interreligious dialogue and cooperation. And look at Brazil. The last presidential election was made by the shift of the evangelical churches to support Bolsonaro, who joined them from the Catholic Church. He was first baptized in. So, I mean, in, and I, I could mention the, 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 the rise of the political Buddhism in, uh, in Myanmar or in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, and many other examples. Madagascar, where the, where the presidential election is made uh, with a very strong interference of the, of the churches and so on. So, <clears throat> I think that though these, uh, these uh, analyses that we can make about uh, the present international situation will comfort the idea that there is a return of religion. And this is a subject for philosophers. I tend to believe that in human mankind there is a need for a kind of transcendency to a vertical inspiration that uh, the human beings are not animals like others because we, we have interrogations about the meaning of our life, where are we coming from, where are we going to. This is philosophy, it's not diplomacy. So the diplomacy can just take into account that this in religious uh, uh, reality does exist and play a role in international matters. For me, I have another interrogation. Is there a return of religion? I'm not sure. 
to be frank. I am not sure. Because this would suppose that religion has disappeared. And when we look at history in detail, we can look that, we can see that it did not disappear. But it's true that the West, I'm speaking for, for, for Europe, Probably, probably, I don't know Japan very well, but probably it may be also said about Japan. The modern scientific technological uh, societies um, came to believe that religion was something belonging to the past and that it was something marginal. And the process of secularization of our societies uh, supported this trend. And the fact is that we are now in a situation where we are were awakened in a brutal manner. We, we, we wake up and you know, when you, you get out of your sleep, there is uh, uh, some seconds of uncertainty and you look and you have Daesh in front of you. It's, of course, a simplified uh, picture, but which, which is a reality. And we discovered that, in fact, we, the Western societies, secularize. Finally, we are not equipped to deal with this challenge. And this is the situation where we are. And that's why, more than ever, it is important today that diplomacy deals with religion. It's especially true for a diplomacy like France. France pretends to have a global diplomacy. There are not so many countries in the world which have this pretension. What is a global diplomacy? We are interested by any question anywhere in the world. We are a permanent member of the Security Council, and we want to remain it. And at the same time, we deal with every aspect of uh, international life. Politics, economics, culture, arts, sports, and religion. If religion does play a role, we have to, to deal with it. I often say to my fellow ambassadors when they, have, when they go abroad and we have the, the global meeting during half a day with everybody around them to, to tell them their instructions, I tell them religion is like football. You like it or not? But it's important in our societies. I was ambassador in Qatar. I'm not specially... Um, uh, a football lover, but when I was ambassador in Qatar, Qatar had bought the, the famous club Paris Saint-Germain. I had no choice but to be interested in, in, uh, uh, in the Paris Saint-Germain uh, life. And religion is the, the same thing. I would like in, to insist on that. It's not a question of being religious or not, or it's not a question of believing or, of believing or not in God. It's a question of looking at the world as it is. So if we must deal with, uh, with religion as diplomats, how should we do it? Uh, once again, I shall not be exhaustive. I just want to, uh, to give some indications, some food for thought, as uh, we, we say in, in, in English. I would say that first, there is a need to, to, to discern very carefully what is religious and what is not. I remember a French politician, he was a member of parliament, and he had just discovered that in Islam there were Sunnis and Shi'is. Better late than never. He didn't know before, he got the information and said that he had understood everything. And he told me, you know, I, now I understand the world. Everything is about Sunnism against Shiism. 
I am polite, so I didn't say any comment, but it was difficult for me to understand how this could explain the, 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 the Rohingya case in, in Myanmar or the, 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 the Marxist re, re, rebellion in Colombia. So we, I think be, 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 be beyond this, uh, this joke, based on, on, on a real case, we, we have to be careful. Uh, it's foolish not to take into account the religious factor because it means that you will misunderstand the situation. You will under-evaluate what religion can inspire to the people for the best or for the worse. You will misunderstand the roots of some conflicts. You will not use some actors who can be peace actors. So it would be a very strong mistake. At the same time, it would be a very strong mistake to believe that everything is religious. And so it requires uh, uh, an analysis work which has to be very, very fine, very detailed. I'll give you some examples. I've been posted in Jerusalem for four years and I can tell you my conviction that the Palestinian issue is not a religious one. It is a political one. It's not a question between Jews and Muslims. It's a question between Israelis and Palestinians. And among the Palestinians you have Muslims and Christians. But it would be foolish not to see that there is in the question of Palestine and Jerusalem uh, a religious dimension. As uh, my friend, the former uh, Catholic patriarch of Jerusalem, uh, Michel Sabah used to, to say it, the, question, the, the mathematic equation of the conflict is simple. One land, two people, three religions. So it's interconnected, but the roots of the conflict are political. Uh, another example, Iran versus Saudi Arabia. The, the, the common understanding in, in the international uh, press now is that it's a conflict, a secular conflict between uh, uh, Sunnis and Shiites. I, I don't deny this aspect of the problem. I don't deny it. But let's look at history. Let's take some, some distance with history. Iran has not always been Shiite. Only from the 17th century with the Safavid dynasty. Let's go more, furthermore in, in history. The region has not been Muslim from the beginning. In, the, in, in, in antiquity, you, you had in Mesopotamia, you had a, 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 a Semitic Mesopotamia around the, uh, the kingdom of Assyria, now ba Babylon, more or less Iraq, and the kingdom of Elam in the south of uh, Iran, uh, which be, used to belong to an Indo-European world, and they were fighting 3,000 years ago. So the, 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 the opposition and the confrontation between the two, uh, the, the two sides of this world is much more ancient than the, the, the religious uh, oppositions. And I believe that the key of the question is a conflict to regional supremacy between the two big powers of the region. But there is an, a, a religious dimension for, to, to, mobilize, to mobilize the population, to, 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 to build and elaborate a political narrative, religion is used. Which means that it's very important to, to, to distinguish and to try to, 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 to prevent the use of instrumentalization of religion for political purposes. For a very simple reason, 
I, I believe that when you have a conflict, you cannot get out of the conflict without a compromise. And God is not a matter for compromise. So if you put God in the conflict, you can be sure that the conflict cannot be solved. And this is really, it's a job for diplomats to, to try to make this distinction. In Central African Republic, in 2013, when France, uh, the French army intervened to, 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 to put an end to massacres or to at least avoid that it, that it goes worse and worse, um, many people thought that uh, the conflict was a religious one. The, it's not true. The conflict came from the fact that the country which has natural resources is one of the poorest in the world. That the, the, the state has never, never been really established. That there are external interferences. That uh, there is no state, and state of law in, in the country. No real government. No security. And one pr Muslim president replaces a Christian president. Jotodia replaces so the people begin to think ah, a Muslim replaces a Christian, it's religious. Intellectually, it's so comfortable to, to believe that. But it does not give you any, any instrument to solve the crisis. At the same time, I must say that when the French army intervened, we wanted to find Centrafrican people, people from the country, to establish a political process of reconciliation. We did not want to do it by ourselves. We, we didn't have any legitimacy, and, the, and uh, the French army could not do it. And the only people that we met who were able to do this job were religious leaders. The Catholic Archbishop, the president of the Protestant Church, and the Imam of Bangui. Which brings me to another point. We have to be able to distinguish what is religious and what is not. But we also have to be able to distinguish between religious people. Which means that we have to know them. And we cannot know them if we do not deal with the religious factor. I spoke about the Central African Republic. You had religious people. Christians or Muslims, who were just putting oil on the, on, uh, uh, on the fire to make things worse, saying, you have been expelled by Muslims, well, it's the fault of the Christians, and to, 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 to preach for revenge on a, a religious uh, basis. And you had those three wonderful people I mentioned, I would like them to get the Peace Nobel Prize in the coming years, who they took big, very important risks, including for their own life. When, when the archbishop opened the garden of the cathedral to welcome Muslim refugees, to, 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 to ensure their safety. And, and when the imam said the same, the same thing for Christian refugees welcomed in, in the garden of the mosque, they, they took risk for their life. And so we have to be able to recognize that. We have to be able to know among religious people and communities which ones will be able to support the peace process and which ones are going to torpedo a peace process. If one day in, in the Middle East, if one day by chance the Palestinians and Israelis manage to get an agreement. The, the international community will bless the agreement through a, probably a resolution of the Security Council uh, of the United Nations. And then on both sides, we'll have people who will say it's a treason, uh, it's, uh, it's a treason, this Lord land was given to us by God, we have no right to give up. And you, you, you have 
you will have to work to make this the influence of these people limited. And on the other side, on both sides, uh, at the same time, you will have people who will say, of course, it's a compromise. But life and peace are more important for a believer than the ownership of the land. And we'll have to work with these people. What we shall be unable to do if we have no acquaintance, familiarity, knowledge with the people, with the religious people. Need to, to discern also between what is religious and what is just a social habit. Uh, I've been uh, ambassador in Qatar, and I've, I could see how the society, which is a, a Muslim, Bedouin, very conservative and traditionalist society, lives. To some extent, their way of life is inspired by religion, which is Sunni, radical Sunnism, if I can say so, because it's Wahhabism. But for many, many aspects, it has nothing to do with religion. It's just the social habit. They, a very, very important person in the government of Qatar told me, when you, you, you think about us, just think that we were Bedouins before being Muslims. And these social traditions have uh, been perpetuated in, in, uh, in history. And people tend to believe that they, they, they behave that way because it's a religious prescription, which is not the case. So it's very important because the, the challenge for every society today is to remain itself, to, 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 to keep its way of life, but in a way which is compatible with modern world. I remember a discussion in Paris with a, a Salafist uh, militant who was very, very aggressive, and he told me, I'm a Muslim, I must live like, uh, uh, like the prophet. And he made a trouble in, in, the, in the subway in Paris, uh, so that uh, somebody uh, ring the, uh, the, the action, the, 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 the alarm uh, ring, the, the, the train was stopped, the, the police came, there was, uh, there was a first, and he was saying, I must live like uh, the prophet, uh, and I'm not allowed to do uh, according to my, my, my faith. And somebody just asked him, are you sure that the prophet was using the metro? <laughs> so uh, once again, be, behind this joke, I think that there is a real question which, which is, uh, which is reason, which means a real and objective expertise. And it will be my, my last point under this uh, chapter, expertise. But do our societies have it? I doubt, I, I doubt. And you know that when, when a diplomat says perhaps, it means no. <laughs> So uh, I think that it's a challenge for our societies in France, in Europe, but not only. I travel a lot of in, in the Muslim world, and I see so much ignorance about religion, including sometimes with very religious people. And ignorance, the French philosopher Régis Debray uh, says it, I'm quoting, ignorance is the cradle of intolerance. So we need to recover uh, religious literacy. Once again, it's not a question of believing or not in God. This is a private matter. But we need to understand. France is a country of Christian tradition. If you go to the Louvre, a good number of the pictures are religious ones. But if you don't understand who is standing on the cross, you will not understand the, 
just the, the meaning of the picture. If you, if you see a baby, a baby in a very poor uh, environment, uh, uh, and you are not able to identify that it's the, 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 the nativity of Jesus, you will not understand. It's a question of culture. And so I think that there is a big need, uh, requirement for a better uh, culture. Now, still uh, five minutes, ten minutes, okay. okay. Um, how does France, the secular country, the country of laïcité, try to, to, to deal with that, try? Because uh, I, don't, I, I think that we have to be very humble in, in front of these questions, and I do not pretend that I'm bringing to you the solution, the universal one. I'm just trying to share, I'm happy to share my, my modest experience, and maybe, maybe to uh, to, to share with you um, the, the best and, and, and the, the, the worst uh, things that we, we get from our experiences. The, the, as uh, Chairman Tanaka said before, France is, you say, the only one, I would say, maybe the only one for sure, one of the very few countries uh, where there is a high-ranking diplomat dealing with religion. It's a paradox. Uh, uh, I told you that for me it's not a paradox. There is a, there is a logic. So this is a position of advisor for religious affairs. Interesting to know, the position was created in 1920. So next year I, I shall celebrate my centennial. And <laughs> It will be interesting to, to think about it. Interesting to see that it was created just a few more years after the establishment, the proclamation of laicity. For, for centuries, we had lived with the uh, system of a concordat, you know, a concordate between the, the Holy See and, and, and the state, and that's it. Uh, and now, if the state is religiously neutral, the state, there is no state religion anymore. We have to create a new kind of relations between the church and the churches and, and, and the government. And that's why the position of the conseiller advisor for religious affairs was uh, cre created for. Uh, second remark, the originality of this position is that we try to deal with religious issues as a global item. I have some counterparts who are ambassadors for freedom of religion. It's only one aspect. I, I, I work on freedom of religion, but I work also on this challenge to understand the religious dynamics in the world and to, 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 to speak with the religious leaders and to, to the religious communities because you have religions where you have communities but no leaders. So today, in the 21st century, I can say that my missions are in the number of three, to simplify. The first one is to advise the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the colleagues of the Ministry about religion. It begins by giving information, explanation, in a way which is understandable by somebody who has very little time to, 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 to give to this question. Uh, I, I never believe that when the minister goes to Japan, he will spend the, his whole day to speak about Shinto or, or, or Buddhism. But he, he wants to have a small paper, very clear, explaining, by the way, what is Shinto? Uh, if you ask French people, I'm not sure that a good number will be able to, to, to answer. So we have to give, to provide an expertise. And France is very much engaged for, for the Christians in the Middle East. For, for, for the last five centuries, uh, we had a treaty with the Ottoman Empire on this subject. Okay, but who are the Christians in the Middle East? 
What is their specificity? What is a Syriac? By the way, is it Catholic or Orthodox? It depends. You have a Catholic Syriac church and an Orthodox, but when Orthodox Syriac church, Orthodox does not mean the same thing that when you speak about the Byzantine, Greek, or, or, or a Russian church, you have to provide the, the knowledge about it. You have to provide this analysis I was speaking of at the beginning to discern what is religious, what is not, what is political, what is the, the not religious, but the, the people believe that it is religious. And we cannot do it alone. Maybe my, my culture is um, maybe necessarily, necessarily, after five years, better than others, but I don't know everything. So I have to work with scholars, academicians, uh, religious people, with the, with the embassies, with the, the, the geographical departments of the ministry. My second job is to talk with the religious actors. I say that we, we are a global diplomacy, we want to speak with everybody, so I speak with re religious actors. Speak about what? About everything. Everything of common interest. And it begins sometimes by very practical thing, things. We have foreign imams for Muslim communities in France. It's a question of visa, of administrative procedures. So it's a, pro a problem of Islam, maybe. But you must know that in, in the French Catholic Church, 20% of the, the active priests are foreigners mainly from Africa. So there, there are administrative matters to, to solve. But we speak also about every item of international life. We, we speak about uh, peace and security. Religions are interested in peace. They are interested in security. When, when the French church has missionaries in Africa, in Central Africa, in, uh, in northern Cameroon, in, in the Boko Haram area, we, we have to work with them to, to, to try to, to, to ensure their security. Uh, <clears throat> we, we, we speak about human rights. Everybody is for human rights. Everybody is for freedom of religion. We speak like international law about freedom of religion or belief, which includes non-believers. When you speak about the rights of non-believers in some countries, it's, it is a problem. Freedom of religion means freedom to change your religion. We know that in some countries it's a big problem. In some countries it's punished by death penalty. So there, there, there is a good range of things to talk about. We, we, we talk about international justice, world governance, development, ecology, environment. Uh, one day history will say how, how effective and efficient Pope Francis was in 2015 when France was hosting the COP21 on climate change. And there were some countries for ideological and political reasons who could not, um, uh, who, they, 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 they were not ready to sign and the uh, French president called the Pope, saying, can you help me? Can, and, and the Pope called some of, the, of the, the heads of state. So we are in a very active diplomacy, you know? It's not, uh, it's not only um, exchanging ideas. Uh, major issue. We, we talk with religious actors about how to fight religious extremism, religious radicalization. How does it happen that a, a, a youth uh, living in France with the French nationality, having gone through religious, uh, not religious, French schools, and he comes to a point where he believes that his religion commands that he would kill people? How, how is it possible? How can it happen? It's a very complex question. It would be a subject for another lecture, maybe. Uh, but 
we, we have to really enter this question in detail. And there, there, there is a, a security, police, intelligence uh, aspect of the subject. There is also an ideological, a psychological um, question. The question of a, a certain kind of religious speech which preaches hatred. We, we talk about interreligious dialogue. The state is not religious. It cannot be an actor of interreligious dialogue. But the state knows that interreligious dialogue is an instrument for peace. We have to support it. How? It depends. It depends. But I usually say that if the state cannot be the writer of, of the text or the actor, he can provide the room. He can provide the, the light. He can provide the, um, the applause. He, 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 can, uh, um, he can express his support, his, his uh, appreciation. And there are many, many, many other uh, subjects. But I'm not the only one in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, I have some colleagues who are also in charge specifically of some religious aspects of diplomacy. Of course, we have the, the embassy to the Holy See in Rome. Uh, people are surprised to learn that we have a priest inside the embassy paid by the French government. He is an expert who tries, who helps us to understand the meaning of uh, the the Pope's statements from, from a religious uh, insight. We, we have a special religious role in Jerusalem. We have a very old consulate in Jerusalem, um, which is in charge of protecting uh, Catholic religious communities on behalf of an agreement which was signed in, 19, in 13, sorry, 13, uh, no, 15, sorry, 1536 with the Ottoman Empire. And we have also in Jerusalem, we have a Jesuit priest inside the consulate to deal with this matter. Our consul general in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia is a special envoy to the OIC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Once again, because we want to take into account the reality as it is. But and it will be my conclusion. My, my, personal, uh, my personal battle, my personal fight, is to convince all my colleagues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that they are also in charge of this. Like football. You like it or not, but you have to take it into consideration. Every year I have one hour to speak with the new newly recruited diplomats. In one year, in one hour, I'm not going to explain to them Christianity and Islam and Judaism and, uh, and uh, Buddhism. No. My, my, my message is just one thing. You have to be interested in this matter and you have to get literacy. Because without this literacy, you won't be able to understand what is at stake on this chapter, which is very important in international relations. And with your permission, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. それでは大変お待たせいたしました。これからパネルディスカッションに移らせていただきたいと思います。ポーセル大使のお話、あの、フランスだけではなくて、ま、世界を見ていらっしゃる。で、その中で紛争の中で宗教がどういう役割を果たしているかということを見ていくことが大事である。というお話のポイントと、それからま、フランス国内で、ま
であのできたんですけれども大変世界中からいろんなところでお話をなさっている方でございますけれども、まあ、あの私たちもこの「イスラム理解」という新しい授業を今年から始めましてあの、まあ、いろんな方々が日本に入っていらっしゃるこの新しい時代に宗教をどういうふうに考えていったらいいんだろうか。という意味で、まあ、フランスを先行事例の一つとしてあの3年前からいろいろと教えていただいておりますなので今日はあのまず道道大使の方からですね、まあ、中東のご経験が非常にお長いんですけれどもその中東とか世界の,あの中で見た時のこのイスラムそしてフランスの例というのことに関してちょっとコメントをいただけたらと思いますよろしくお願いしますはいあの道道と申しますえー、とあのポーソル大使のお話ですね、えー、大変あの興味深く伺いました、まあ、私もこのフランスの来して、まあ、日本語に訳せばですね政教分離、えー、ということですけれどもこの政策はですねこれからの日本にとってもですね、えー、非常に大きな意味を持っていくんじゃないかというふうに考えていますというのもですね皆さんご承知の通りえっ、ー、と日本ではですね、労働力不足になって、えっと、これからですね、多くの外国人が、まあ、移民ではありませんけれども、労働者として、まあ、日本に入ってこられる、まあ、労働者以外でも入ってこられて、その中でですね、えー、彼らとの、まあ、多文化共生と言っておりますけれども、この多文化共生の基本がですね、やはり宗教に対する適切な理解だと思うんですよね。えー、と我々がホストしておりですねそ,のそこに来られる世界の特にイスラム諸国の人たちに対する新しい理解がなければですね多文化の共生は不可能だからだと思うんですそういう意味でですね、まあ、日本もこのある意味この,あの新しい憲法でですね新しいというか戦後の憲法でこの政教分離が徹底していますけれどもしかしフランスのこの来世の歴史を見ますとカトリックとの関係から始まって国家が例えばですねカトリックのその私学の学校に補助金を出すのが正しいかどうかこういう議論もですねずっと最近まで行われてそれから2017年でしたかね大統領選挙を見てますと。あのこれがですねみんな大統領の候補は内しては守るんだということを宣言しながらもその解釈についてはですねいろんな意見が出てるわけで今も現在今ただいまもですねこの宗教との関係をどういうふうにその考えるのかという議論がなされてる特にフランスはですねまあ非常に長いあの非常に大きなイスラムモスラムの,あの国民も抱えているわけで、えー、そういう議論が行われていること、まあ、生きたですねこの来してだと思うので、えー、そういう点を踏まえて今日お,お,お話を伺ったことは非常に、えー、私どもはあの勉強になったと思いますそこでちょっと質問をあの大使にしたいんですがこれは中東のことですそれでまあ私はですねあの、えーこの中東今あの大使がおっしゃった通り宗教がですねの役割が、えー、とその世界全体で、えー、の非常に大きくなっているのかという点については、えー、と多分、えー、大きくなっていると思います、えー、特にアメリカの福音主義、えー、あのトランプ大統領のもとでですね中東ではあとネタニヤフそれから今まで,です、ね、アルカイダがそのとのそのトロとの戦いがです、ねえー、とイスラム国というものもです、ね、生んだとそれから、えー、と2000、えー、ということがあるわけですけれども私はです、ね、2003年要するにイラクとの戦争ですねこの時に、えー、とブッシュ大統領だったと思いますけれども中東にはです、ね、中東諸国を全部民主化するんだと。100年かかってもそうするんだと言われたわけですね。それで2004年に、まあ、2003年にフランスのエビアンサミットがあって、2004年にですね、えっと、アメリカでサミットがあったときに、えっと、G7、つまり日本も含めてですね、賛成してくれと
言われたわけです。その時にですね、えっと、まあ、シラク大統領が、まあ、内々、つぶやいてるのを、あの、聞いてたんですけども。えっと、まあ、中東諸国が。中東諸国はですねアメリカがそんなこと言っていることに対してじゃあ自分たちの国をですねアメリカは潰すつもりなのかと,と言ってですね特に王国はすごく怒ったわけですねでシラク大統領もですね、えー、となかなかあのその中東諸国が表面的にサインしてると言ってもですね本気ではないだろうとおっしゃってたのをですね、えー、覚えてるんです。それでですねそれからまあ、10年経たないうち、えー、と2011年にアラブの春が起きて、えー、それでですね、えーとまあ、チ,ュチュニジアで始まったわけですけれどもエジプトの例ではですね、えー、このイスラム主義者がですね、えー、政権を選挙で取ったわけですね、えー、しかしですね2011年に、まあ、あの政権を取って13年にはですね軍のクーデターによって、えー、壊滅していくと。それでですね、この中東はですね、この話は、えー、まあいろんなあの意味を持つんですけども、えー、一つはですね、まあ、中東諸国において、まあ、大使もおっしゃった通り、とかヨーロッパの諸国、それからアメリカがですね、非常に大きな影響力を持って、お互いにこうその、えー、とその相関関係を持っていたというのは事実だと思うんですけども、えー、とヨーロッパ諸国はですね、この、えー、中東の民主化を支持すると言いながら実際にはイスラム主義者が政権を取るのを快く思わないんではないかというその、えー、ことがですね、えー、ずっと言われてきたと思うんですそれでまあ、えー、率直な質問ですけども、えー、それについて、えー、どういうふうなお考えを持っているのかそれからですねイス,ラム諸イスラム国ができた時に我々みんな驚いたんですが、えっと、最初はイラクとシリアだけだったんですね戦闘員は。しかしそれが80カ国以上からですね若者を集,け集めたわけです。でどう見てもですね破壊と殺戮を希望する人たちが入ってきたこれは何なのかこれはどうしてそんなことが起きたのかとお考えなのか。つまり、えー、とそのですね私はこの2つの質問はどこかでつながっているような気がするんですだから非常にですねこの話はあの難しい話だし人によって答え方っていうか考え方は随分違うんだと思いますけどこの大使がですねせっかく長年のこういう歴史あの経験をお持ちなんで、まあ、個人的な意見でも構わないんですけれども教えていただければと思います。道道大使ありがとうございましたでは続いて、えー、と NHK 根村解説員にあのコメントもしくはご質問いただきたいと思いますけれども根村さんはあの中東だけではなくて欧州もずっと見てらした方でイスラムにもあの学校で教えてらっしゃるとも聞いておりますけれども、まあ、その広い観点からお話しいただけたらと思いますお願いします。はいえー、私が今日ここに来ているのももともと中東をやっていたものとしてまたあのヨーロッパでイスラムの世界というものを見ていた取材したということで今日ここに座っているんかだと思いますけれどもあのポーセル大使のお話で、えーまあ、非常にお話をいただく前にそもそもです、ね、あの外務省の中にこうしたポストがあって。しかも宗教問題を担当するそして外務大臣あるいは外務省職員にそうした情報を提供したり事情を説明するさらにはその宗教界との対話を進めているというお仕事ということで非常に興味深く伺いました特に日本を含めてほとんどの国でそうしたポストがないのではないかなと世界を見て、えー、分析する上でやはり宗教という側面も非常に考えなくてはならないんだなと、えー、私たちこれ日本にとっても非常に重要なことではないかなというように思いましたであのーまあ、フランスというとですねやはりあのー、私たち日本人の中で一番イメージとして、えー、もちろんその来世で、えーのの原則というものもあるわけですね、まあ、教会とその国家の分離
まあ、今ではそれがもうイスラム教も含めてもう宗教を持ち込まないということだとは思うんですけれどもそれが逆に日本でのニュースではよくありました2004年にはあの学校でヘジャーブを着用を認めないということもありましたし2011年ですかねあのブルカニカブを公の場でも禁止するような動きも出てきましたしつい最近ですと、えーブルカとビキニですかブルキニの着用を禁止するといったようにフランス国内では非常にそのイスラム教徒に対して厳しい政策というものが打ち出されてきたというのが私たちは非常に強くニュースとしてはニュースで聞いているわけですね。またあの最近ではやはりあの国民連合などによる反移民反難民の動きというのが非常に、えー強く出ているわけですであの、まあ、ここから先質問になりますけれども先ほど大使はフランスの哲学者が、えー、無知は不寛容のゆりかもだというお話をされましたあこれも非常にあの興味深く伺ったんですけれども、えー、今のフランスではそうしたことが果たしてあの逆にこの排除することによって、えー、他者への理解が進んでいないのではないかということもあの思うんですね。あの無知は関与のよりかもということで、逆にこの宗教を持ち込まないことが、えー、異なる宗教、異なる文化をへの理解の妨げになっているのではないかという気もするんですね。えー、まあ、そういったことも含めてなんですけれども、このフランス国内では、えー、シャルリー・エブトの事件もありましたし、先ほど言ったようなそのブルギニの禁止もあれば、反難民、反移民という、まあ、あの動きが台頭しているわけですけれども、こうした国内の動き、あるいは国民の声というものが、外交に、えー、どう影響しているのか。国内問題と外交に矛盾があるのではないかという気もするんですがその点について、えー、大使のお考えをいただければというように思いますまたあの先ほどですね、えー、大使はあの世界の宗教家宗教指導者とまあ交流を深めてきたそして、えー、宗教界との対話を非常に重視しているという話をされましたけれどもこれまで、えー、その中には例えばイスラム過激派などとの対話というものも含まれているのでしょうか、えー、またそういったことによってその対話によって交流によって具体的にどのような成果が上げられたのかという点も、えー、教えていただければと思うように思いますはい、二村さんありがとうございましたそれではあのポーセル大使の方からお返事をいただきたいと思いますよろしくお願いします Thank you very much、um... I feel a little bit embarrassed because I don't know how I can manage to, to answer all the questions included in those, two, in those two questions. I'll try my best. First, I'm very happy to hear Ambassador Domici, 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 Domici、uh, because he has been posted,、uh, he has been an ambassador in Iran, and I, I served in Iran, not at the same time, but very, not very far away. And we could have met there.、Um, the, the Middle East. I, I, I spent my diplomatic life in, in, in the Middle East or in Paris on the Middle East.、Uh, it's a fascinating、uh, region. Sometimes people tell me you are an expert, and I said, no, I'm not, I'm not an expert because the more I know, the more I know that I don't know. <laughs> Uh, the, the region is very complex, and we, we, we have to, to, to keep this in mind. Maybe the big mistake done by the Americans in 2003 when they invaded、uh, Iraq was to believe that the, the situation was finally simple. And President Chirac at that time, as Ambassador mentioned, opposed. And he, 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 I remember that he resumed、uh, in, in a conversation with President Bush, he resumed, he, he summarized his、uh, thoughts saying, the situation is horrible and you will just make it worse. And finally, that's what, what happened.、Uh, so the Middle East is very, very, very complex. What, what can I say、uh, um, to. to, to Try to, to answer the questions of Ambassador.、Um, first, of course, France is 
for human rights and for democracy. The, 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 the disagreement with the, the, with the, the Americans in 2003 was not there. We would like, we would like so much to have a, a democratized world everywhere, and especially in the Middle East. I, I must say that if you compare to the situation in the US and, or in Japan, Europe is in a specific situation. We are the neighbor, the direct neighbor of the Middle East. Uh, if, if Myanmar is in trouble, it can be a challenge, a problem, a moral uh, uh, challenge, but it does not affect the security of, of France. The Middle East does, much more than it, it does affect the, the, the security of, of the US. And so we have a very, very strong interest in it. Uh, but we, we, we believe that uh, you cannot impose human rights. We, there, there, there have been some, uh, um, some tries in history and it, it never worked. Maybe the only case it worked was at the end of the Second World War. But it, it could work because it was imposed by a complete winner. Yeah, there was a complete victory and the winner was in a position to impose it is will. This situation is not at all the same in the Middle East, and I don't. I expect we shall not have the third world war in the Middle East for the purpose of democracy. It's not. It's not the option. So, the 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 the, the solution is to have um, the 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 only way is to have the solution coming from the people. But it takes time. It takes a long time. Uh, all the processes of, of political changes takes the time which is required by, to, to change societies. Uh, famous uh, French sociologist uh, Pierre Bourdieu wrote a book, you cannot change a society by a decree. And it's true also with international uh, community. Uh, if we talk about religion, and the state. I strongly believe that laicity or not, societies need a kind of separation between religion and society. There is a need, a kind of, which is not necessarily the French model. But it's very difficult for some people to accept such an idea if for centuries your society has been living and there, the, 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 the mixing between religion and, and policy. And me, the French guy, I love them, and I'm going to tell them uh, for, for 14 centuries you were wrong. I'm going to, to give you the, 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 the solution. It's not just not realistic. It's not uh, possible. So I'll take an example to, to, to say, uh, to, to, to illustrate what we try to do. As I told you, uh, we have a very strong connection with the Christians in the Middle East. I, I, we can come back to this history when the King Francis I in the 16th century, uh, he, he, he was very embarrassed because his enemy was uh, uh, both uh, Emperor of Germany and King of Spain, the same man, Emperor Charles V. And France was in the middle. It's the worst joke political position you can imagine. So he had to, to find a, an alliance against the Emperor Charles. And behind the Emperor, there was the Ottoman Empire. And he concluded this alliance, which rebalanced the geopolitical situation of Europe. But he was a Muslim. And we, we were only 80 years after the collapse of Constantinople. So when talking about the Ottoman Empire at that time in Europe, you were talking about the devil. And the king managed to get something, the right and the responsibility of France to protect the Christians in the Middle East. So when criticized, he said, yes, I signed with the Muslim uh, Sultan, the Ottoman Emperor, but I am now able to protect the Christians in the Ottoman Empire. 
And for five years, France was very much involved. In, in 1816, France sent military troops in Lebanon to stop massacres against Christians in Lebanon. Mm. We cannot do it that way anymore. First, because the agreement has been, uh, is finished, was canceled after the First World War, and because the world is not working that way anymore. So in 2014, when Daesh invaded the plain, the Nineveh plain in the north of Iraq and persecuted, killing, expelling, raping uh, in a very cruel and brutal manner, we, we, we tried to mobilize the international community. But what we wanted to do was not only for the Christians, because you have other minorities, Yezidis, Shabaks, Mandeans, and also because in a Shia country, Sunnis are a minority, and vice versa. And so we, we, we wanted to, to push for the respect of all minorities. And second, we wanted to make it with the countries of the region. We even invited Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, which pushes for a very intolerant mood of Islam, and many people were considering that they had a at least an ideological responsibility in that. But if we want to protect the minorities without the involvement of the government of Iraq, the government of Syria when peace is re-established in the country, forget about it, it will, it will not work. And now, in 2019, five years later, four years later, we shall organize another conference in October in Paris. And we asked Iraq to co-chair the conference, just to show that the change also has to, change, uh, has to come from the countries themselves. But it will take time. We shall focus on the, 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 the discriminations in, in, in the region. So every country will tell you we have no discrimination. We are not in a position to, to accuse them. Let's work together. I'll give you an example. A Muslim country decided to review all the school books to eliminate discrimination and negative stereotypes. Very, very good job. I, I, I applaud. They just thought that mathematics books, there was no problem. It's just mathematics, you know. So, one year, when the, the exercise was finished, somebody said, look at this mathematics book. It's an exercise. It begins like, we, like, like that. A Jewish banker lends, lended money to a poor Muslim peasant. Stereotype. Stereotype. So there is a huge work to, to, to do to change the, the mentality uh, of the people. And I, I, I think that the, the European experience can be useful, because in Europe, we, in, in our history, we had a good amount of stereotypes and prejudi prejudices. That's what we try to do. Uh, now, laïcité, laïcité, so many, so, so many things to, to, to do. Uh, laïcité, immigration. So, um, France is in a very different position uh, compared to Japan because we, we, we have a lot of immigration, but we always had. Since the, the, the Middle Ages, look at the map of Europe, when you had tribes and peoples and newcomers coming from Asia and from the East, when they, used, when they arrived to, 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 to the ocean, they stopped and it was in France. So from very old times, the French population has always been very, very uh, mixed, so that nobody can say what is the typical French uh, um, physical appearance. Now, we have uh, new waves of immigration, 
and a good number of them, not all, are Muslims. So that Islam became the second religion in France with about five to six million people, which means eight, nine percent of the population. It's a minority, uh, although in France we don't use the, the, the word minority. It's, we are very, very careful on that. Um, so I'll, I'll give you some, just not a global answer, but some elements mm. to, to, uh, to answer. First of all, what I can see is that the ma vast majority of these people are integrated or are in the process of being integrated. Mm. Takes the, the, the full process takes two generations. The first generation comes and they want to find a job. They, they came for economic reasons. And so the first generation was saying, uh, okay, I'm not moving just my job. The second generation was already French, but maybe they were f divided. They lost their roots in the country of origin and they didn't have deep roots yet in France. The third generation is integrated. Now you have French diplomats with Arabic names. You have, uh, uh, you have a, a huge numbers, uh, number of uh, uh, marriages between, uh, I mean, uh, new French and old, uh, and old French, if I can say so. So the process of integration works. But of course there are some problems. The problem, one of the aspects of the problem is that the media, I'm not criticizing journalists, but it's a necessity. The, the, the media talk about what do not work. I usually say, yesterday I came from Paris, my, my plane safely landed in Tokyo, nobody talked about it. If, if I had crashed, you would be aware. And, and it's the same with the, 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 the course of society. So there is a responsibility, maybe for media, but for governments and for citizens also, to re-establish the vision of that. Second point, we, we uh, five to six million Muslims, we, I think the, the figure is not a scientific one, but I think that we can uh, assume that maybe 50,000 Muslims are radicalized. 50, 5-0. It's a huge number. It can be very dangerous for the society, and it's a challenge for our security. But it's maximum 1% of, of, of the, the, the people. And we have to deal with this, having in mind those two aspects of, this, of the, the question. And once again, there is a responsibility for the government to speak about this, with wisdom, honesty, nothing to hide, but nothing to dramatize. Let's take things as they are. In this context, I would say that uh, it will be uh, my, not last, but only two things. Uh, uh, my, my comment on laicity is that I think that laicity is more useful than ever. Because what is the principle of laicity? Separate religion and the state so that every citizen will be free and equal, whatever their religious beliefs. And I think that the principle of laicity is important in the integration process, provided that it is understood as a principle of freedom. Does not mean that freedom is absolute. Every public freedom can be limited by law, but limitation is limited. And finally, we, we want to dialogue with everybody. What about radical Islamists? <sighs> A difficult question. In 2011, when the, the Arab Spring happened, the minister at that time, Alain Juppé, said, we're going to speak with everybody, provided that human rights and acceptance of democracy are saved. But the state, which is religiously neutral, will not qualify 
a Muslim. I have my own opinion. But publicly, we shall never say he is conservative, he is a little bit extreme. I don't like this bishop because he's too progressive, or he, this one is too, is too uh, conservative. It's not a question for the state. The question for the state is the law. Do you respect the law? And the law, you have the freedom of, free, of, of religion, but your freedom will be stopped by freedom of another one. If you want to impose your view, there is a problem of freedom for everybody. And of course, the use of violence is a, a, a non-starter. The question is more difficult when it appears that some people can give up violence. When, if they give up violence, when should we begin to talk with them? But there is a, need, a time when we need to, to give a, a signal of encouragement to this um, trend. それではちょっとあの遅れてしまっておりますけれども皆様からのご質問コメントをいただきたいと思いますあ,のあまり時間もありませんので、えっと、お一人お一つということでよろしくお願いいたしますそれからあのご指名とご所属を差し替えのない範囲で教えてください、えっと、じゃあ一番真ん中の産業フロンティア研究会の本田博史と言いますあのシラク大統領のお話が出ましたけど非常にあの繊細な外交をされておりましてあの宗教の問題に関してもあの歴代の大統領は非常に神経を使っておられると思うんですがあのリスク回避ですねイスラムとの例えばその原子力発電所に攻撃を加えられるということは、まあ、今までフランスではなかったわけですが、まあ、事故もなかったわけですがそのリスク回避に関してフランスの外交団はどのような、えー、対策を取っておられるのかあの、まあ、一問ということなので、えー、またあの東大寺の別途を務められた森本厚生という方、uh, Chief Abbot Emeritus Kosei Morimoto、uh, published a paper in French on Islamic system. であのその方の意見によれば、キリスト教の排他主義、Exclusion Principle of the Christianity というのは、つい最近まで改められることがなかったということで、それをその改めのためにフランスの政治や外交はどのように努力されたのかそ,それについてちょっとご意見を伺いたいと思いますありがとうございました他にございますかじゃあその Thank you very much My name is Saho Matsumoto from Nagoya City University I'm an academic I'm actually expert of the Vatican diplomacy. So your talk is very fascinating. But at the same time, uh, so I know the situation of France and Europe, you know, the religion, the politics and Vatican diplomacy, but you mentioned about the evangelical uh, thing in US. And the, actually, US also have, a, like, a, your position is, I think, religious freedom ambassador or something like that. So if you know anything about it, do you have any um, encounter or exchange with the American representative and what do you think of that? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Miyoshi. Uh, I'm, I'm a journalist. Uh, I have a question to Ambassador uh, Postel. Uh, I think the most difficult question today is how to cope with the Muslim uh, Islam fundamentalism and uh, before I think uh, there was uh, uh, such an optimistic opinion that uh, uh, Euro uh, Islam uh, so moderate and uh, tolerant uh, Islam uh, is possible but uh, today uh, such a discussion uh, uh, is not so uh, popular anymore 
uh, rather uh, the, the main uh, the, the, the such opinion as uh, Islam uh, as a religion uh, has 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 uh, problem. Uh, Islam as as a religion uh, has uh, a very intolerant principles. Uh, so uh, Islam uh, as a religion is a is a problem. Uh, how do you think about it? Okay. Um, thank you. I shall not comment about the, the, the nuclear aspect of the, of the question because it's not my, uh, my, uh, um, my specialty. Um, we, we, we have no problem with, Islamists, with Islamic people. They are just people like uh, others. And it's very important, uh, I always repeat, that we should not deal with Islam only under the security aspect. Uh, I, I lived in Muslim countries, and I tell my Muslim friends, in Shia, in Sunni, in, in Wahhabi, in non-Wahhabi, my experience was wide, and I enjoyed it very much. I have very good friends. And I, I, I don't think that there is any, uh, um, I, I mean, uh, any, any problem by principle. It happens that today there is an ideology which is not completely new, but which was spread by, um, as a result of modern ways of communication. You know what we say in French. In France, we say that the, 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 the biggest dangers for our security are Imam Twitter and Sheikh Google. Because on, uh, on the social networks, you find everything. And this can spread, can spread the, 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 the worst ideologies. So we, we have to deal with this ideology. It's not dealing with religion. It's not dealing with Islam. And I think it's very important. That's why I said maybe 15,000 radicalized people, not all of them ready to, to become terrorists, but some with, I mean, extremist state of mind, but only 1% of the, of the population. And the population is integrated or, or, uh, or being integrated. And we have to keep that in mind, otherwise we shall divide the society. And I, I, I think that our society, which during centuries has integrated people from different origins, not only can do it, but is doing it. Um, uh, now now it, it brings me, me back to, to, to the, the last question, which was a little bit connected to yours. Um, how to, to deal with uh, uh, fundamentalist Islam? First of all, I would like to say that there, there is a, a conceptual uh, difficulty. What is moderate Islam? What is r radical? What is fundamentalist? Uh, would you ask, uh, would you go to the, to, to the church and ask the, the priest, are you a moderate priest or, or, uh, or not? No. The, uh, and it's not, it's not a, a uh, a question which goes to mind for others. So the question is raised because there are some uh, fundamentalist movements which are using violence. And I think that the question is there. If somebody wants to have a bird like this because the prophet had the bird like this and it is his choice, well, I may, I think that if I was him, I wouldn't have the bird like this, but it, it is his choice. He will have to comply if he is in the army and the regu military regulations say uh, no, no bird in this, uh, in, in this army. But it's not a problem. The problem is the use of, uh, of violence. So what is uh, the, the, the mechanism which brings people to think that their religion commands them to use violence. This is what we, we have to, to, to work um, on. Is Islam intrinsically uh, violent? Well, there are big debates. Personally, I don't think so. 
Uh, I don't think so, because if I thought so, it would be in contradiction with the quality of my friendship with so many uh, Muslim believers. So there, there is a, a contradiction. I now, have no prejudice against Islamic people. I just saw the American Islam, so I was just interested in risk management of French system. But if you want a conference of risk management for nuclear power plants, I'm not the, the, the good lecturer. I'm coming back to what I was trying to say. Um, le, The question, the 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 the, the, the question is um, um, that if if I uh, I want to prove that Islam is violent, I can find in the Quran one sentence which will prove it. In any tradition, you can prove these kind of things. The, the, but, but we also know that if you take only one sentence without the context. Uh, without the explanation, you manipulate the text. And this should not be done. I'm coming back to the need for religious literacy. We have to be able to, 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 to work on, uh, on that. But um, if you are uh, uh, not religiously educated and some, somebody who has a kind of charisma, and you are a, a, a young man, you don't know much about life, and this man comes and says, look what is written, you, you, you understand that your, your way of practicing your religion is not the good one. I can tell you, I can teach you. You are not prepared to, 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 to answer. I also think that the, the challenge uh, for other religions and Islam, but maybe mainly for Islam today, is the question of coping with modernity. How can a religion remain uh, in line with its convictions and adapting itself to modernity. Uh, not to be modern, but just because modernity is the way of life of our societies today. Uh, how, how to keep the, 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 the core and, and the, 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 the main points of, of religion and to adapt itself? Um, if you want to live like the prophet, do you think that it's absolutely necessary to be dressed as he was 14 centuries ago? Uh, uh, if you want to live like the prophet, do you think that you are allowed to use the metro while the prophet uh, was not using? And these questions have to be, to be dealt uh, by all the people, and they, they can be uh, wisely solved only if people are educated, not only religiously speaking, but I think that education is a key to fight uh, religious radicalization mm -hmm. because it will provide the people uh, the capacity of thinking by themselves and saying this guy is very seducing by his speech, but it, it tells me that I because I believe in God, I should kill my, my, my neighbor. Somewhere there is a problem. The, the, so the, 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 the education as raising the, the personal conscience of the people is something very essential. Uh, les les, the evangelical uh, Americans, um, uh, I'm ready to talk with uh, all of them, uh, with everybody. Uh, not only in America, but also in, in Africa. Uh, I must say that in many cases, they don't want to, to have a dialogue. In many cases, they are locked in the certainty to be right and uh, uh, to, to be the owner of, uh, of truth. And many of them are not open to dialogue. But if they are, I always ask, uh, as I ask my, our embassy in Tokyo, I told them, provide me with many, many, many meetings, and I'm ready to, to, to meet um, everybody. Because I, I, I want also to, to, to understand them, uh, and to also to tell them that uh, France maybe is not exactly what they believe we are.
ポステル大使<笑>ありがとうございましたすいませんあのもう時間があのかなり過ぎてしまいましたので皆さんたくさんご質問いただいてるんですけどあの今回はここであの閉会ということにしたいと思いますえっとパネリストの皆様ありがとうございましたそれからポステル大使ありがとうございました。<笑>